been studying the life of Abraham. Abraham is referred to as the father of the faith. According to the Bible, Abraham was saved by faith. Faith is the only ticket to heaven. Many people are going to miss heaven because they're trusting in their own good works. If you ask some about heaven, about eternal life, they'll say, yes, I'm going to heaven. I'm a good person. Well, the problem is, the Bible says, good works will not save you. No one is going to heaven based on his or her good works. So I want you to understand this morning, and we find this in the life of Abraham, we find this throughout the Word of God, Faith is the only ticket to heaven. The only way to be saved is through faith. Okay? Faith must have an object. The object of saving faith is Jesus Christ and His sacrifice on Calvary's cross. That's what we're remembering today if we come to this communion service. It's the message of Jesus Christ and the cross. We are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ and the sacrifice that He made for us. Abraham is an Old Testament picture of salvation by grace, or by, uh, by faith. We are justified by faith. Abraham is also a picture of sanctification. You see, God chose Abraham and separated him from his old life. Remember the call of Abraham? God called Abraham and told him to pack up everything, leave his family, leave his kindred, and resettle in a faraway land. That was the first test uh, of Abraham's faith. And, uh, and then we find that God totally transforms our lives. He changes us. And as we've studied the life of Abraham, we found that he was far from perfect. That his life was filled with conflict. His life was filled with difficulty. But God was working in his life. And when we study the life of Abraham, we see the providence of God in the life of the believer. And if you look at your own life as a believer, you can see how God is working in your lives. He is guiding you. And He is teaching you. And He is convicting you. And yes, sometimes He disciplines us as, as believers. And, and we see His providence in our life. And, and we find here in our text this morning, sometimes our faith is tested. That's what we find as we read these verses this morning. Let's read our text, Genesis chapter 22, beginning in verse 1. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on, the, on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. So I want you to notice the first thing in your outline this morning, the test of faith. The Bible teaches us that our faith will be tested. First, our faith will be developed. And I want you to understand God is working in your life as a believer to develop your faith. And He's wanting to develop certain things in your life as a Christian. So He's developing our faith. As we experience God, as we grow in our relationship with Jesus Christ, God is developing our faith. God is working in your life to develop you and to make you into His image. And many times along the way, our faith is tested. And if we study Abraham's life, we certainly find that over and over again, his faith was tested. Um, look, how should we respond to that? When our faith is tested, how do we respond to those trials of life? Well, notice what James writes in James 1, verse 2 and 3. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. So you see again, God is developing some things in our Christian lives. James mentioned patience. According to the Bible, it's through trials and difficulties that we Develop patience. Do you ever pray for patience? See, how does God answer that prayer? It says it's through various trials that, were, that patience is going to be developed. And Abraham went through many trials in life. He had difficulties that he faced. Now, sometimes this trouble was because of mistakes that he made. So sometimes he brought trouble upon himself. Do you ever do that? It's our own decisions. 
Things we say, things we do, it brings difficulty to our lives. We bring trouble. Sometimes we're our own worst enemy. And we certainly find that in the life of Abraham. Abraham. But there are other times it was because God was testing his faith. God was putting his faith to the test. And James wrote, when this happens, we should count it all joy. In every circumstance in life, in everything that we face in life, we're to have joy. And count it all joy. God is working in your life. That's what we need to remember. And God uses these circumstances in our life to grow us and to strengthen us in the faith. Doesn't that encourage you this morning that God is working in your life? That He's developing you through all that you're facing in life. In this process called sanctification, God is developing us into His image. We're growing in His likeness. And He is building up, He is building us up in the faith. Therefore, we should embrace the trials that we face. And we should let God mold us. And we should let God teach us. When James says that we should count our joy, he's talking about the outcome. We're not just looking at the circumstance that we're in, what we're going through, the trial that I'm in. We're looking at that. We're looking forward to the outcome of it. What God is going to do. What God is going to develop in my life. And the glory that awaits us. Sometimes the only thing we can look forward to is what we sing about this morning. One day the trumpet's going to sound. And we're going to go meet the Lord in the air. And we're going to live with Him forever. Do you ever have days when that's all you have to look forward to? Why don't we turn these lights down up here a little bit? It's hot up here. I don't know if you're hot or not. But I'm hot up here. I'm going to work up and sweat this morning. So, so when trials come, when difficulties come, when what we call negative circumstances, they come to us, there's an outcome. There's something that we can look forward to. These verses didn't make, this verse didn't make it to the screen, but turn over and find the book of Hebrews in the New Testament. And I want you to find chapter 12. And I want you to look at verse 2. I'm going to give you time to find this verse. I want you to see what it says. Hebrews chapter 12. And I want you to find verse 2. And I want you to see what it says. <laughs> This goes right along with communion this morning when we come to the Lord's table in just a little bit. Look at Hebrews 12, verse 2. Everybody have it? Look at what it says. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and have sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Notice, who for the joy that was set before Him. Now, did Jesus count the cross of Calvary joy? No. But He endured the cross because of the joy that was ahead of Him. For the glory that was ahead of Him. He was looking for the glory that would come. I think one of the things He saw up ahead was you and I. Our salvation. The fact that we'd be able to come and be saved because of the sacrifice that He made. That was something for Him to look forward to. But He left glory. He came down to this earth. He gave His life. And then what did He do? He went back to glory. So the joy that He could have was in what the cross produced. The outcome. How to have joy in trials. We look for the outcome. We look ahead. We look for the glory that awaits us. Now, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7, notice what it says. This is the New Life Version. These tests have come to prove your faith and to show that it is good. Gold, which can be destroyed, is tested by fire. Your faith is worth much more than gold, and it must be tested also. Then your faith will bring thanks and shining greatness and honor to Jesus Christ when He comes again. So our faith is going to be tested so that we'll know that it's real. Job understood this. Job 23 verse 10. But he knows the way that I shall take. When he has tested me, I shall come forth as God. 
Abraham's faith was tested over and over again. There was the family test. Again, the call of Abraham. God called him to leave his family behind and move to a new land and reestablish his life there. Now, Abraham passed this first test with flying colors. What would you do if God told you today to pack up everything and leave and you don't even know where you're going? You're just packing up and you're heading out. How would you respond to that kind of test? Well, Abraham passed the first test with flying colors. The family test, he was able to leave his family behind. But then we get to the famine test. He made it to the promised land. Soon after he gets there, there's a famine in the land. Now, God said, I want you to live here. And I'm going to take care of you here. I'm going to provide for you here. But he failed this test. He didn't stay there in the promised land and trust God. What did he do? He went down to Egypt. He failed that test. Can God provide in a famine? Can God take care of you in a famine? Sure. But Abraham failed the famine test because he didn't believe that God could provide. You see, Abraham had to learn, and we all have to learn, that God can provide for you in any circumstance. Have you passed that test of believing that God will take care of you? That you can trust God? That you can believe God? Anywhere you are, any circumstances, any circumstance that you're in, God's going to take care of you. Listen, where God guides, He provides. Amen? <laughs> if you're going with God, you can have confidence and assurance that God's going to take care of your life. So Abraham went through one test after another. Like us all, sometimes he passed the test. Sometimes he failed the test. But God was working in his life to develop faith. And he was, his faith was growing. He was growing stronger. He was getting closer to God. Now we come to the ultimate test of Abraham's faith. God's going to call Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, the son of promise. Now we've all, we remember the story of Isaac, how Isaac was born when Abraham was 100 years old. And when God made the promise, Abraham was 75, he waited 25 years for the son of promise. And now Isaac's a young man, so certainly Abraham does not have hope that if Isaac is sacrificed, that there would be another. So what a test this is going to be. God called Abraham to sacrifice Isaac as a sign of his faith and obedience to the Lord. So I want you to notice two things. A, Abraham's love was tested. There in your outline, Abraham's love was tested. Genesis 22, verse 2. He said, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. Now, God knew Abraham better than anybody, anyone else. And he stated here that Abraham loved Isaac. But who did Abraham love more? Did Abraham love Isaac more than he loved God? Abraham's love was tested. Let me ask you a question this morning. Is there anyone that you love more than you love God? Is there anyone that you love more than you love God. Look at what Jesus said in Matthew 10, verse 37. It says, He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Now, should we love our family? Should we love our mother and father? Should we love our children and our spouse? Yes, of course. But there's one love that supersedes all the other loves that we have. And all the other people. There's no one that we love more than we love God. And, and I believe, I thought about this. This is something that's developed too. God is developing things in your life, like I said. And this is one of the things that God is developing in our life. Our love for Him. How many of you say, I love God more today than I did 
a year ago, Amen. back yonder when I first met mm -hmm. the Lord. So God, your, your love is growing for the Lord. I, I love Jesus more as the years go by. So God will develop our love for him. And God worked in Abraham's life to lead him to the point. You see, now he's at the point where he can pass this test. His love was tested. Notice also Abraham's devotion was tested. Instead of questioning God, Abraham obeyed without hesitation. Now look at it. The place of this sacrifice was like 50 miles away. This is before planes, trains, and automobiles. <laughs> and I got Google out, and I love Google Maps, and I put Bonita Springs in there, and I started looking for destinations that are 50 miles away from Bonita Springs. <laughs> if you go to La Belle, you've traveled 50 miles. Or if you go straight on up the interstate to Punta Gorda, you've gone 50 miles. So imagine taking your pack mule here, your donkey, and your servants, and you're walking 50 miles. The point is, he had plenty of time to think about it. He had plenty of time to back out of it. He had plenty of time to change his mind about going through with this, but he didn't change his mind. He, he didn't back out of it. Abraham's devotion to God is seen in his obedience. So I want us to look at that. Number two in the outline, Abraham's obedience. Abraham was obedient to God. How important is this in our development, in our faith, in our relationship with God? God spoke and Abraham obeyed what God commanded. And, and if we say that we're truly devoted to God, then what we find in His commandments, if we look at His commandments and we find His word, Jesus said, if you love me, what? Keep my commandments. So we're going to obey the Lord. We're going to be obedient to his call. Now I want you to see here, he follows God's directions. In preparing for the journey, Abraham brings everything needed for the sacrifice. Look at verse 6, Genesis 22, 6. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in his hand. And he knocked. He had the wood. He had the fire. He had the knife. He's getting everything he needs to make this sacrifice. He's obeying God. He's bringing everything that he needs. He's following God's directions. Verse 9, Then they came to the place of which God had told him. And Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. So he followed God's directions and I want you to see he put all on the altar. Everything is in Isaac, right? Go back and look at the Abrahamic promise, the covenant that God made with him. Everything's in Isaac. He puts all on the altar. Can't help but to think of what it says in Romans chapter 12. Look at Romans 12, 1 and 2. Paul writes, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Holy, that is set apart for God. Holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You should have noticed the word sacrifice. <coughs> Talking about the sacrifice that Abraham was willing to make. And the sacrifice that Paul says is our reasonable service. Sacrifice. Oh, we don't like to hear the word sacrifice, do we? <laughs> to give our lives a living sacrifice to God. And the word sacrifice, of course, it suggests suffering. It suggests pain. It suggests loss. Sacrifice. In this world of unlimited accumulation and and pleasure, we hate to hear anyone talk about sacrifice. God calls His people to sacrifice. And we find this many times in the Scriptures. When God is doing a work, when God is building something, when God is doing something, when God calls His people to any task, 
He always calls us to sacrifice. The lesson of Abraham, people who truly are devoted to God will be willing to sacrifice anything and everything to the cause that God calls us to. If we're living sacrifices on the altar of God, that means we're willing to do anything. We're willing to give anything. We're willing to go anywhere that God calls us to. Christians ought to be sat, uh, uh, serious about the work of the Lord. Amen? You think we should be serious about the call of God and the work of the Lord? The work of the kingdom? I want to ask you this morning, what are you willing to give? What are you willing to sacrifice? See, that's the, another thing altogether there. Just giving something. That's easy enough, isn't it? The basket's going to come around after a while. Did you come prepared to give today? That's part of worship. Do you understand that? Giving is a part of worship. Have you ever put anything in there that was a sacrifice? That you're giving up for the cause of the kingdom? I look at our budget, and I look at the budget of other churches today, and I see churches struggling. And when I see that, I wonder about the faith and obedience of God's people today. And it's not just the economy, because we believe that God is our supply. doesn't matter about the economy. doesn't matter about anything that's taking place in, in the world around us. Faith is the issue. Obedience is the issue. Remember the first test that Abraham failed? We talked about it. He gets to the promised land. That's where God told him to go. He's just following God's direction. But he finds a famine there. And God says, I'll take care of you there. But he doesn't believe that. He hasn't grown to that point yet. So he goes to Egypt. And eventually he has to learn that God will take care of you no matter what the circumstances surrounding you are. Sad fact is, most Christians give a minimal amount of their time, energy, and resources to the kingdom. It's revealed that the average Christian today gives less than 5% of their income to the kingdom cause, to the cause of the kingdom, to the church. And I, I, I ask people about serving the Lord. You know what I hear a lot? Why don't we serve the Lord together? Why don't we get in the church, which is why God called us to be a part of it? Let's serve the Lord. You know what excuse I hear a lot? I'm too busy. Too busy. Don't have any energy. Don't have any time. My life is filled. We ask for money. We ask for resources. We ask for the budget to be met. Well, you know, I'm just broke. I don't, I don't have any money to give. I don't have anything to give God. I don't have any time. I don't have any energy. I don't have any money. My question would be, what are you doing with all your time? You know, we have the same amount of time. How many days are there in a week? Seven. Seven. How many hours are there in a day? 24 hours in a day. Anybody have more than seven days a week? Anybody have less than seven days a week? Any, anybody have more or less than 24 hours in a day? Anybody? I want to talk to you if you can get more hours in a day than just 24 hours. So what it comes down to, what am I doing with my days? What am I doing with the hours that I have? What am I doing with the time that God, what, what am I filling up with my time with if I don't have any time for God? Is that a fair question? You think God, is that a fair question for God to challenge us with this morning? You don't have any time for where you're spending your time. What are you doing with all your time? You don't have any money. Well, if I went out here in this parking lot, you know what I would find? That's some pretty neat cars out there. <laughs> I went home with you, I'd see some pretty neat things that you've accumulated there at home. I had someone tell me they don't go to church here anymore. See, every time I, every time I mention we got plenty of time. 
We still got communion here, so we're not going to beat the Methodist to Perkins today. So just yeah. it. Every time I mention giving, I always have somebody come and ask me questions and say, you know, give me excuses. So I had this, this member a few years ago. I just can't. Pastor, you just don't understand. And then about three weeks later, this person came to me and said, we're not going to be here for a couple of weeks. We're going on a cruise. <laughs> All right. Just three weeks ago, you're telling me, you know, why you can't give anything to the church, but now you're telling me you're not even going to come to church because you're going on a cruise. Here's my point. We have time for what we want to do. We have energy for the things that are important to us. And we have plenty of money for what's important to us and what's a priority in our lives. Amen, oh me. Amen. As a businessman, he traveled to Korea. He had a missionary as a guide, and they were driving through the countryside. And there was this young man, he was pulling a plow. And his elderly father was driving the plow, and this young man was pulling the plow. And the, and the businessman said, these people must be poor. And the missionary said, well, they're Christians, and they were trying to build a church out here. And they wanted to give to the church, and they didn't have any money, so they sold the only ox that they had and gave the proceeds to the church. And, and he quickly responded, the businessman said, that must have been a sacrifice, or that was a great sacrifice, and the missionary responded and said, no, they were just glad that they had an ox to give. I'm going to say one more thing about this, then we're going to move on before you just tune me out all together. <laughs> but we're talking about a sacrifice. We're looking at that word. We'll sacrifice for our children. We'll sacrifice at Christmas time. We'll, crack, we'll, we'll sacrifice for our career. We'll sacrifice for just about anything. But when was the last time you really gave a sacrifice to the Lord. Time, energy, or money. You think about that. When was the last time you really gave a sacrifice to the Lord? See, that's the big question here. What are you offering God? What are you offering God? Are you, are you giving anything that be, could be called a sacrifice? But how, how does God respond to that, that kind of sacrifice? Notice very quickly the third thing in the outline. I want you to see God's faithfulness. Abraham was trusting in God's faithfulness. He was standing on the promises of God. And he believed that God would provide. That's what the message is this morning. I'll give you the introduction. Now we've got the message, all right? <laughs> you believe that God will provide? Amen. Verse 5, Genesis 22, verse 5. I want you to see what Abraham said as he started out this three-day journey. Abraham, or when he got there, Abraham <coughs> said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship. And notice, we will come back to you. So notice his faith. He believed all along. I'm going to go over here. We're going to build this altar. I'm going to put Isaac on it. But God's going to provide, and we are going to come. We're going to return then verse 7 and 8, Genesis 22, 7 and 8, But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. Then he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, read the rest of it with me. God will provide himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. God will provide for himself the lamb. Notice, God provided a substitute. That's A there in your outline. God provided a substitute. <coughs> Let's pick up there in verse 10. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. 
So he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the place the Lord would provide. As it is to this day, the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. God provided a substitute. And listen, this is a picture of Jesus Christ. Why did Jesus come? He came to give his life. He, gave, he died so that you could live. He gave his life so that you could have eternal life. God provided the sacrifice. He provided a substitute. Jesus <coughs> stood in my place. Died for my sin. He who knew no sin became sin for me. And I want you to see one more thing here in our outline. God blessed Abraham abundantly. Genesis 22, 15 through 19. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, blessing I will bless you and multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men, and they rose and went together to Beersheba. And Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. God blessed Abraham abundantly. You know, there's some verses in the Bible, there's promises that God gives us that if we have faith and we are obedient, that God will bless us. Do you believe God blesses us who are faithful and obedient to Him, to have faith and are obedient? Very quickly, I just want to read two passages. <coughs> Write these down, go home and look at them carefully and read them again. And listen as I read Malachi 3.10. This is a great verse here. Great promise. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and try me now in this. God saying, put me to the test. We talk about how God puts us to the test. God saying, here's an area where you can put me to the test. Try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. And I could read many other verses like that. But I want to read one more passage, 2 Corinthians 9. Beginning with verse 6. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly nor of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Why do we clap every time we take the offering? Because God loves what? A cheerful giver. I don't have to care how you give, but God loves a cheerful giver. Amen? <laughs> But here's what I want you to see, verse 8. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. That's what God will do. If, you, if you're willing to give, if you're willing to sow bountifully, God will make sure that you always have something to give. An abundant amount. That's what he's saying here. Verse 9, as it is written, he has dispersed abroad. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness while you enrich in everything for all liberality which causes thanksgiving through us all. God's talking about a bunch of poor folks that didn't have any money, but they gave above their ability, and God made sure they had plenty more to give. You believe God can do that today? This is a New Testament passage I'm reading here now. The Lord will provide. 
He's provided something very dear to us this morning. We come to remember the price that Jesus paid for our sin. Remember what I started with this morning. I said Abraham was justified by faith. Faith is the only ticket to heaven. You think you're going to heaven because you're a good person, because of your good works. You're mistaken. According to the Bible, it's by grace through faith that we are saved. Not of works, lest anyone can boast, but it's by faith. There's a hymn that we sing, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left the crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. When I came to Him in faith, when I trusted Him as my Savior, when I put my faith and trust and hope in Him, He forgave me of my sins, came to live in my life, gave me eternal life. By faith, you are saved. And if you give your life to Him, just like Abraham, He'll, he'll take your life, He'll take you through a journey, He'll teach you, He'll mold you, He'll shape you, He'll develop you. You'll grow in love, you'll grow in faith, you'll grow in giving, you'll grow in service. And I pray that that's happening in your life as a believer, that you can see the providence of God in your life. If not, there's a problem there. We need to talk about it. And I'd be glad to sit down and talk with you and pray with you and share with you what the Word says. But the greatest thing that God has provided for us is His Son, Jesus. And he came to die on the cross for your sin. He died for you. You believe in Him this morning. If you put your faith and trust in Him, He will save you right now. I, I base that on His word. He's promised. Whoever believes in Him shall not perish for what? Have everlasting life. Whoever believes in Him will have everlasting life. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord, what? Shall be saved. Bow your heads with me.